The second talk will be given by Oma Bayraktar, uh, who is a group leader at the Welcome Sanger, Sanger Institute. Please go ahead. Super. Thank you, Christoph. So fantastic to be here. Uh, uh, I was sort of like regretting that this was not next week and, you know, we didn't have Oktoberfest, but then the organizer explained to me why that decision was made. Uh, so, you know, well, I think I would have probably given a better talk. I just, uh, um, so really fun to be here. So, you know, um, I'm a neurobiologist with, uh, I'd say, computational leanings. So I think, you know, you'll see less technical details from my talk. But I really try to motivate you on why I think this combination of single cell and spatial transcriptomic biology, why that's interesting to our biological questions and how I think this is really laying the ground for what I call next generation pathology. So again, you know, our lab is mainly or mostly neuroscientist. You're interested in understanding cell type diversity in the human brain and how this changes in, the, uh, in different diseases. And a lot of our questions are anchored in the tissue microenvironment. We want to be able to study cells in their native tissues. We want to be able to localize them to their microenvironments. And we want to be able to sort of understand their conversations, these interactions between different cell types in those tissue environments. And the workflows that we use with omics, I think, are familiar to many of you. You know, uh, a lot of our projects sort of start with the uh, high-throughput single-cell omics, you know, be it transcriptomics or now joint, uh, you know, profiling of things like chromatin accessibility. Well, we really try to identify cell types, cell states, and things like gene regulatory programs. And then to be able to sort of map these cell types into the tissue space, we use spatial transcriptomics. And our hope is that this sort of like two-pronged solution is really one that you can under use to understand either in health and disease, you know, first quantitatively characterize tissue microenvironments, but then understand, you know, what are like these sort of you know, healthy tissue interactions between different cell types or what are these pathological interactions. And one that's actually diagrammed here is the communication between a tumor microenvironment cell and a brain cancer cell that is related to, you know, things like, you know, clinical phenotypes like malignancy switches. So, um, you know, a popular way to go about doing a spatial tissue reconstruction is the integration of single cell and spatial transcriptomics. And to be able to do this in complex tissues to map really, you know, fine grade cell types and cell states, you recently teamed up with Oli Stegel, uh, led by a fantastic grad student, Vitaly Kleschemniko. We developed the Bayesian cell to location model that basically integrates single cell and spatial transcriptomics to attempt this type of mapping. Uh, so, you know, the paper's out, the code has been useful, you know, I'll show you some examples from literature, you know, south location in the wild, so I'll sort of try to keep this bit short. So the idea here, as implemented many others, is to treat the single cell data set of a given tissue as your cell type reference. You know, this could be as simple as average gene expression profiles of your annotated cell types, but we also provide more complex models to uh, extract these gene expression signatures. Then we take count-based spatial transcriptomics data. This is really, you know, tissue positions versus gene expression patterns. You know, it could be really any type of spatial data from, say, Visium to, you could even go to image-based modalities like Murphysher and C2 sequencing. Then and we perform this, you know, probabilistic estimation of the contribution of these reference cell types into the spatial transcriptomic data accounts at each tissue location. And when you do something like this, the advantage is that in one step, you'll be able to estimate the spatial positions of all of your cell types in the single cell reference in the tissue in situ space. Now, uh, a little under the hood, so the model is a negative binomial uh, model of RNA counts and spatial data. You know, with cell to location, the things that we pay a lot of attention to in the model is the differences in the technical sensitivity. You know, this is the detection ability of single cell versus spatial transcriptomic methods for different genes. But we also model things like additive backgrounds, such as, con you know, contaminating RNA molecules floating in the spatial transcriptomics data over your tissue section. And we also incorporate things like cell type co-abundances, right? Uh, you know, lots of functionally related cell types and tissues are non-surprisingly physically co-located next to each other, right? Because they are coupled. And actually incorporating these types of components into the model really increases our ability to be able to map the locations of things like rare cell types. Now, uh, as this has been out, what I'd really like to focus on is sort of the biological motivations for cell to location. Why did we build it to, to be the way it is? 
Uh, so first off, a lot of the questions that we are interested in in cell atlasing often involve fine-grained cell types. So you know you have things like major cell types, like a fibroplast versus a T cell. But often in neuroscience and beyond, a lot of our questions involve the really fine-grained specialized cell types of these major classes. And these are often, you know, I think kind of the most novel outcomes of cell atlasing studies anyways. So with cell to location, we really pay attention to uh, you know, mapping these. And what you can see here now is a, you know, an unpublished data set from the lab. We regenerated a large atlas of the human motor cortex with single nuclei sequencing. Among one major classes of cell types, excitatory neurons, we have 27 different subtypes alone. You know, these are relatively transcriptionally similar, but they have very important distinct properties. And with cell to location, what you're seeing here now is like some human brain resume data from the same uh, organ, from the same brain region. And we have mapped these, as you can see, excitatory neuron subtypes, I think about 12 of them shown here, into these different cortical layers that kind of create that arc. And what you can see, I hope, is that we can really, you know, distinctly map all these different subtypes across these cortical layer divisions, but also within each anatomical layer, we can distinguish the locations of these guys. And that type of fine resolution is important to us. Um, second, I think cell to location and other, you know, these spatial transcriptomic data deconvolution methods can be applied readily to image-based spatial transcriptomics. And I think that's kind of like an emerging nice application. But what we really built cell to location to do is to deal with transcriptome-wide data, data types like Visium and slide sequencing. And that's because, as you'll see in the second part of the talk, we're really interested in sort of like discovering different disease-associated gene expression patterns in human tissue samples. And if you sort of look into the wild, for example, this uh, independent benchmark carried by Lee et al. earlier, published by Lee et al. earlier this year, you see that satellite location really performs best when it comes to, you know, these transcriptome-wide spatial data sets or simulations made from single-cell RNA-seq data sets where, you know, they simulate fake spatial data from the combination of uh, sampling different single-cell RNA-seq data sets. And finally, I think, you know, with spatial transcriptomics, the big applications are really in places that we just haven't looked a lot, right? So this is uncharted tissues, and in terms of the spatial architecture of tissues, I would say most human tissues are uncharted still, and especially I think diseases are very much uncharted. And a couple of examples, if you're interested, are some of the fantastic collaborators we've been part of at the Sanger Institute, for example, the Teichmann and the Mentotorma Labs, who have published these multimodal spatially resolved atlases of the human gut, as well as the human gonads. We have a very fantastic, you know, interesting project ongoing with Oli and uh, several others on high throughput multimodal mapping of the human glioblastoma. If you're interested in that, I'll be very happy to talk about it. And it's really fun to see these sort of like in the wild applications. So, you know, Julio Saez Rodriguez is a fantastic study applying, you know, single cell spatial omics to studying cardiac diseases. And just, I think, a couple of weeks ago, there was this cool paper from Barbara Trotline where they used subtle location to map cell types in the salamander brain. I mean, you know, it just sounds cool. So um, what I'd like to do in the second part is to really sort of focus on this disease angle, right? And sort of talk a bit more about what I described now as next generation pathology. And the idea here, I think, you know, I'll focus on COVID, which sort of started as a good Samaritan science project, but then really turned into this fascination and really two year long project in the lab. So I think it's now legitimately a real project. Uh, but, you know, the sort of the paradigm I'd like to talk about is I think is very typical of many different diseases, not just COVID. And the idea here is that we have very good characterization of disease and tissue pathology at the level of these old classical modalities such as H&E stainings, right? So a pathologist can look at these H&E stages, identify all kinds of different disease cell states, but in terms of the molecular and the cellular correlates of these different disease stages, we have most of the time not a clue. In the case of COVID, what the pathology that uh, you would care about in the human lungs is called diffuse alveolar damage. It's really the most sort of distinct histological pathology. And what you're seeing here now are these H&E stainings from three different parts of COVID-19 lungs. So on the very right, what you're seeing is a part of the uh, COVID-19 patient's lung, which looks normal. So, you know, this is sort of these fine alveolar structures distinguished by H&E staining. In the middle, you can see the beginnings of this diffuse alveolar space, uh, diffuse alveolar damage uh, process, which I'll shorten the DAD for now. And the early steps are called exudative or acute or early DAD, right? And you know, there are a couple of telltale histological signs, things that are called, like, 
for example, hyaline membranes that a pathologist can spot and identify. But then later on, what really starts killing patients is the progression of this early damage into this hybrid fibrotic process called organized ad or proliferative or late, in other words. And there's also some other stratifications you can make in terms of middle stages. And the big problem that we were faced with is that, you know, there's this histological, pathological progression, but we really don't know the different sort of molecular drivers of these processes or the cellular drivers. And specifically, what we would really like to understand is the sort of process at the very beginning, this early dad. The late dad, we know that there's lots of fibrosis, lots of things have gone wrong, but if we can find things that are just starting to go wrong in exudative dad, maybe we can interfere and, you know, contribute to the therapies of these patients. So this turned into be to be a really multi-lab effort led by a fantastic postdoc, Jimmy Lee. I'll try to sort of sum summarize the efforts of several different labs here. So uh, the approach we took experimentally was very similar to the, what you saw in the first part of the talk. So we started with uh, compiling a single cell, single nuclear RNA sequencing atlas of the human lung. So this is both healthy and COVID-19 lungs. And I think, you know, in parallel, there are all these awesome lung community efforts, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So that was really fun. And then in parallel to that, we also generated this pathologist-guided spatial transcriptomic data sets using this standard string technology of these different lung alveolar damage stages. And then we integrated these two at the end using the cell to location to be able to really identify the cellular compositions of these different injuries, right? So at different stages, are you seeing different immune or other cell types coming in, but also potentially their interactions. So now this is the single cell data part. So this was some fantastic work from Mikhail Anaceda's group at Imperial College. And what they did was like kind of like a, you know, now I guess old school integration. They put together a bunch of um, healthy and COVID-19 lung data sets. So I think, you know, in total, this exceeded something like 130 donors, had both cells and nuclei. Uh, again, healthy and COVID. And, you know, here the integration at the beginning was done by SURAT for cells versus nuclei, and then I think it was the Harmony calibration for donors in the 10X versions. And you can see we have several hundred thousand cells for both COVID-19 and healthy donors. In terms of the annotation, at the beginning we did that sort of painstaking manual annotation, just going through all of these, and you know, I think that was fun, and we identified some interesting patterns. But then I think the lung community really stepped up and create, started creating these really comprehensive atlases. So what we actually settled for was this automated annotation where we took a single cell, single nuclei reference of the healthy lung that was generated at the Sanger Institute by Kirsten Meyer and Sarah Teichman's lab. This has been out for a while, and now it's in press in Nature Genetics. And you know, we picked this data set because uh, a couple of reasons. First, it had actually profiled multiple parts of the lung, you know, both the parenchyma and the airways, and I can tell you a bit about why that's important later. The second, you know, these are immunologists, so they created a very, very fine-grained immune reference, I think, among myeloid cell types, or like 20 cell types alone. And third, they also had things like, you know, Visium that we helped them out a little bit, so they were able to map all these different fine cell types into different lung tissue compartments, so sort of, you know, provide a bit more evidence for their annotation. And what we were able to do was to use the cell type as this logistic regression-based framework developed by Sarah Teichman's lab, which has been out for a while, but I think that just got published in this, uh, a uh, science paper of uh, pan-immune tissues to really annotate our data set in one go. Uh, so what you're seeing here is that just at the sort of level one of this hierarchy, we get all the main cell types that you would expect. Uh, cell typist, while I don't think it's at the level of things like SCR, just uncertainty, does provide a bunch of metrics for the confidence of the mapping of the cell types, and often we see that across the main categories of cells, this is very good, right? So this is at the level of single cells, and we don't see something like cells from COVID-19 donors not being confidently mapped versus this just working for healthy cells. So I think while some more work could be done there, we're confident at the level of the annotation for COVID cells. Uh, at the level of the expression patterns of these cell types, if you were to sort of look into the level two of this annotation, where you have things like different flavors of alveolar epithelial cell types, uh, uh, immune cell types like B cells, plasma cells, and all these other stromal cell types, all the expression patterns look good. If you were to do things like differential abundance testing to compare, you know, the amounts of these different cell types, you can't quite see it from, I think, the contrast here. You see that in, you know, this was done using Milo. Uh, you see that in COVID-19 donors, there's this huge influx of immune cells and this loss of structural cells that along like alveolar epithelial cells. So everything is looking good. 
And then finally, important to us is the resolution to get fine-grained cell types. So what you're looking at here now are some of the marker gene expression patterns of the myeloid cell types. So that sort of corresponds to that kidney-shaped cluster at the top right of the immune uh, division. And you can see that we really have nice resolution to call all these different subtypes of uh, myeloid cells. And specifically, the sort of the populations that we're interested in, I'll talk a bit more about, are these new stratifications of alveolar macrophages, which are really kind of the, you know, the first and last responders, as you'll see, to damage. In terms of the spatial transcriptomics, I won't spend a lot of time with it, but, you know, when we started this project, which was admittedly a while ago now, uh, the best uh, applic technology for uh, clinical FFPE tissue samples was the nanostring WTA assay. So this is a rather coarse resolution assay. What you do is that you kind of start with like an HNE or a fluorescent image just to understand, you know, visualize your tissue and identify target regions. Then you often select like a large area which corresponds to dozens or hundreds of cells. In our case, this is about a 400 by 400 micron area which has dozens and dozens of cells in the lung. And then get the sort of uh, using this 18,000 multiplex probe strategy, get like uh, effectively full transcriptome information from that tissue location. Just to squeeze a couple things done by the lab on nanostring data before I move on with COVID. So, you know, we're not strangers to this nanostring whole transcriptome assessing technology. Alexander Evazidis, another great grad student in the lab, had generated a probabilistic generative-ish model to estimate non-specific to basically denoise WTA data. And, you know, this is made, I think, experimentally possible by the fact that this assay also contains a number of negative probes. So, you know, these 18,000 human genes are spiked in with a bunch of probes that should not actually bind and allows you to estimate the background, you know, binding, the background the signal of this assay. And beyond that, a uh, fantastic paper that Alexander had with a postdoc at that time, Kenny Roberts in the lab, they were able to incorporate this into the spatial noise model component of cell to location and map the spatial distribution of developing human brain cell types. Um, this cell to location WTA model was in hibernation for a long time. It was sort of on Pi MC3, but if you're interested, this is now has been re-implemented in Pyro and it's part of the main cell to location repo. So if you're uh, if you have WTA data, you want to do salt type deconvolution, check it out. Finally, sort of moving on to the data set that we had, uh, what we did spatially is that we looked at 33 donors uh, that passed, most of them had passed from severe COVID. Uh, pathologists looked into h &E images, and they primarily annotated these four different stages of alveolar damage. So. You can sort of, I hope, make out that on the top, we have from COVID-19 lungs, tissues that look healthy-ish, so we call them preserved. The early stages of the damage, we can sort of see things are starting to get long, like wrong, a bunch of cells coming in, that's exudative. Then there's like a middle stage, which is mixed, and finally that fibrotic stage is organized, right? Again, every single tissue location was just a bulk 400 by 400 microns. That's really hundreds of cells for human lungs. In terms of the breakdown, the plot you can see at the bottom shows the donors versus the number of tissue locations with a designated pathology. And with this data set, we were able to really sample lots of different pathologies from each donor. So, you know, they're not like huge batch effects, one pathology mapping to just one donor, etc. And just to add to this, here from a small number of donors, they had comorbidities, you know, two donors passed away from cardiac failure. And to us, that's interesting because that is a very different immune profile to someone who died from long COVID-19. But a couple other donors also had these secondary bronchopneumonias. So we kind of use this, we shorten as ACFF and BRON as immunological controls to COVID-19. And finally, on top of this, we also had some long WTA data from four healthy donors. And just uh, before I show you the data, this is now what a real sort of lung tissue section that was profiled looks like. I think this really makes a strong case for spatial transcriptomics, because if you look into this, you see that these different lung pathologies are really could be spatially close to each other. So unless you had super micro dissected single cell RNA-seq, you're really not going to be able to see these distinct pathological states easily in the associative data. And I think it's where really these types of applications, spatial transcriptomics, is a very special use case. 
So in terms of just looking into data, we just start with the bulk gene expression profiles of these WTA pathologies. And nicely, what you see here is that from healthy looking tissue, the preserved to early to late stages of alveolar damage, there are these big transcriptomic changes, right? So that's very comfort that's was very comforting to us. I mean, it's a terrible process, but it's, it's new, you know, to be able to see this type of change. I think this is one of the first times in lung disease. In terms of the genes that change, they make a lot of sense. If you look into those, these late stages of the alveolar damage, oh, that, you see all the stuff that's supposed to be there, coronavirus disease, ribosomes, you know, asthma-related pathways, whereas the early stages of alveolar damage are a bit more interesting, you know, in terms of we don't know what to make of these pathways yet. And I think that just this data itself, the bulk expression profiles, will be cool for uh, human lung immunology. Um, beyond mapping cell types, I'll sneak in one more application, you know, it's from Martin Hamburg, who's another fantastic collaborator on this. We don't really have molecular biomarkers of this process, you know. The pathologists are just looking at HNEs. And with this data set, we thought it could be quite neat to see if you can identify some, a couple of genes that would be neat biomarkers of these different stages of alveolar damage. And, you know, just going through a bunch of different types of classifiers and finally settling out on this, like, random porous and leave an out strategy, Martin was able to really identify, his lab identified these really neat new markers of different stages of alveolar damage. And I was quite happy to see, you know, these things like serpent one which is like a coagulation, you know, like vasculature-related gene, which maps to the early pathology, sort of the one we least understand. Finally, now, uh, moving into the cell type patterns, what I want to start with is just, you know, just kind of like the basic check, the course level cell types, is everything looking like? What was done here is that we are comparing the cell type decompositions of the healthy versus COVID-19 donors. So with COVID-19, we are just, you know, collapsing all those different pathologies under one category. And the deconvolution dummy here is actually two different steps, you know, and for the healthy uh, cell type mapping, we take the healthy single RNA seq data, map it to the healthy nanostring data. For the disease, we take the COVID-19 cells and map them into the COVID-19 WDA data sets. And just by plotting the, you know, the percentages of each cell type in healthy versus COVID-19 cells, you see that it's all looking as expected. You know, you see that the structural happy cells of the long, like alveolar type 1 cells are enriched and healthy, while the COVID-19, excuse me, COVID-19 data set is much, much strongly enriched for these immune cell types. And what you can see on the left are now the sort of the per ROI tissue location, single data points, you see indeed the same patterns. Now, at a more fine-grained level, we are also seeing things that match what was already known. If I were to start plotting the cell location estimates of, uh, you know, COVID-19 cells in these COVID-19 pathology data sets, you see that in the healthy lung, you see enrichment of things like happy vascular endothelial cells, you know, this most strongly in the preserved pathology, and they're lost into alveolar damage. You see things like proliferating AT2 cells, which is thought to be really this attempt of the lung to repair itself in mid-stages of the pathology. And then in late stages of the pathology, you, think, you see things like myofibroblast, you know, T cells, NK cells, which are sign of really things going wrong. And this is indeed something that you see, not just sort of like in one patient or data point. If I were to sort of show the myofibroblast pattern across all of our locate profile tissue regions, you see it there. And if I were to also show you now, we have grouped these profiled ROIs per patient. You indeed see that this enrichment of myofibroblasts and all that is seen in multiple patients. Not all of them but more than half. So I think you know, it's a bit of variability that I'd like to get to. Uh, moving ahead, now the full Monty, right? So we now take the full reference, map it to all of the pathologies, and what we see, I think, is this really remarkable transitions of different cell types, cell states across these pathologies. Uh, I'll go into the detail of one lineage in the next slide, but I hope what you can see here is that just by looking at this, we can identify like uh, collections of cell types, cell states enriched in early stages of damage or late stages of damage, versus there are some cell types that are there from the get-go, some that are mixed, and many others that we are finding to be actually sort of perhaps signs of just general unhappy lungs because they're also very much enriched in these other immunological conditions like this cardiac flavor and bronchopneumonia. 
in terms of, I think, the result that I really like, and I think it's a novel thing, is that if you were to focus on the cell types, we're seeing that the composition of the macrophages in the lung changes significantly from early to late stages. You can see at the top is that this reference from uh, Kirsten Meyer and Sarah Teichman had this really nice fine-grained annotation of different alveolar macrophage subtypes. And what you can see is that the ones in the bottom that are distinguished by the expression of these metallothionin genes, very specific markers, are really enriched in EDAT and then go down, whereas those that we would call a standard macro lung alveolar macrophages that are CHIT positive go up in injury. And again, this is something that you see across multiple patients. Finally, the last point I'd like to make is that with spatial data, even though the resolution we have here is quite low, you know, it's 400 microns, certainly not single cell, but also much poorer, say, compared to Visium, we can still go about identifying co-located cell types and try to map out tissue microenvironments. Uh, with the cell to location workflow, we do this by a second added layer of decomposition with non-negative matrix factorization. And what this really puts out are these basically NMF components with a bunch of cell types that are co-occurring across different, you know, uh, ROIs sampled in a data set. And when you look at this, we apply this separately to different types of pathologies, and I can tell you about why. We see really these co-located groups of cells um, in these plots. The, can't see the legend, but the size of the spots shows the NMF loadings. So you can see, you know, these manually grouped factors that we have put together are groups of co-located cell types, whereas the color shows the cell abundance. So, you know, if they're basically high in EDAT, it means they're present there. If they're low in EDAT, that means they're enriched in other pathologies. And there are a couple of really interesting environments that we have identified here, that these enrichments of vasculature and immune cells. And what we're quite excited about now is now going back to the single cell data, focusing on these co-located cell types and trying to see if there are any cell interactions between these spatially co-located cell types that could be related to uh, the pathology. And here, you know, just our initial analysis that identified some really interesting pathways from macrophages to endothelial cells that we're excited to follow up. So with that, I'll finish right here. I hope, you know, this integrated workflow, I appreciate that it's sort of relevance to really studying human tissue pathology, and I think what we were able to learn about COVID-19 pathophysiology. I think, you know, my outlook on the challenges is that, you know, this sort of near and others got to this biological and technical variability of disease cellular gene expression patterns across different modalities will be high. I think, you know, integrating really quantitative image analysis from pathology is going to be a key direction. And finally, there's lots of spatial data types, right? So it's like our frameworks need to be a bit flexible and nanostring is coarse resolution, but it can actually give you a pretty good idea of large patient cohorts. And I think with the next generation pathology, we're really looking at the application of this really to complex human tissue pathophysiology. So I think it's a very exciting front. If you're interested in that, uh, please do get in touch. And I'll finish here by acknowledging the lab. Uh, Vitaly, Kenny Roberts, and Jimmy Lee did the COVID-19 and self location work. Fantastic set of collaborations, and very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. This is great. Um, the cell interactions, for example, as well as sort of the analysis, that comes from disassociated setting, if I believe. Correct. Right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, of course, yeah. what type of spatial information can you sort of bake in and can you use? Yeah. I know this is super coarse grained with yeah, yeah, nanostring, yeah. but I'm sure yeah. you can think about that. So, you know, since the grain, I mean, you know, since this was really big, we didn't even attempt any of the cool tools that you and others have been developing. But what we were able to do here is do some sort of, I think, actually lower hanging fruit coarse filters. And one of them, for example, was to go back into the spatial data and see if receptors and ligands involved in these interactions were differentially expressed in the bulk tissue pathology, mm. right? So that could be obviously very much complicated by differences in cell type abundance. You're not gonna be able to, in many cases, say, okay, you know, I saw receptor A change like this, blah, blah. But we actually thought, found that we could get lucky in many cases. And this one interaction, for example, which was enriched at the bulk receptor ligand expression in the WTA data in that pathology, but on top of it, the abundance of the cell types was also enriched there, so sort of like double layers. But I think moving forwards, like more principled ways to deal with spatial proximity of cell types would be key. 
Do you think, because like, you have these sort of larger scale structures in these organizations and regions yeah. or so, would that be sort of a, a simple filter that can then downstream use again, let's yeah. say DE as Nia explained or something? Yeah. Like? yeah, I think it's really interesting. So, you know, the, um, I think part of the challenge here is the scale of the tissue microenvironments, right? I think there's general, not a lot of consensus. Uh, you know, people try to formulate hypotheses in terms of, right, that's like, what is the physical scale of signaling between cell A and cell B. There are sort of guesstimations based on the diffusion distances of cytokines, et cetera. But I think one thing that's interesting is to consider what pathologists consider a microenvironment or a pathology. And in our case, the 400 micron thing was actually not dictated by us. It was dictated mostly by pathologists who said, oh, it takes me this much to see it. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you. In the interest of time, we have to move on. Great talk. Uh, more discussion in the break, please. It is my particular pleasure to announce the next speaker. Johanna Kluckhammer was a PhD student in our lab uh, quite a few years ago already, and uh, is now a tenure track professor at the University of Munich in the Gene Center. Please. Thank you very much, um, Christoph, for this nice introduction. Yeah, um, so um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk um, about using single cell and spatial transcriptomics to study metastatic environments. So like the speaker before, um, just with a different application, basically. Um, this is a project that I started as a postdoc at the Broad Institute as part of the Human Tumor Atlas pilot project. Um, and it came with me <laughs> when I started my own lab at the Gene Center. And starting a new group did not particularly um, speed this project up, um, but we, we hope to uh, finish it or finalize it um, this year, maybe. Um, so why are we interested in studying metastatic microenvironments? Well, there's a medical, there's medical reasons, and then there's also um, scientific reasons. And for the medical reasons, it's basically that metastatic disease is basically um, the reason why people die of cancer. So for, for a lot of cancers, people re don't really die from the primary tumor, they, which can often be removed, for solid tumors at least. Um, but what, what actually kills people are the metastases that go into all kinds of organs and they um, just can't be removed and at some point are not compatible with life anymore. On the other hand, um, metastatic disease also often goes hand in hand with um, therapy resistance. So another reason basically why, why metastasis actually kills the patient and not the primary tumor in, in many cases. Um, on the scientific side, metastatic niches are incredibly interesting because they're the, the result of really resilient cells beating all odds. They, the, basically, the cells need to leave the original tumor. They go into the bloodstream, which is extremely ho hostile, deal with all kinds of immune cells, uh, suboptimal environments, and they have to exit the bloodstream, find a new tissue to which they're usually not adapted, um, settle down there, build their new environment. So it's really quite amazing that things like metastasis exist at all. Um, then metastatic um, sites are, or niches are diverse, um, but systematic in their location. So we find metastatic met metastasis in basically all organs, but um, with a preference to, to certain organs. And then these metastatic niches are also extremely complex on a molecular, cellular, and structural um, level, which basically screams for spatial transcriptomics. Um, here, we specifically studied the um, microenvironment of um, breast cancer um, metastasis, and we have a quite um, special setup where for each metastasis, we basically take two biopsies, and one biopsy is either frozen or um, processed fresh, and with single cell or single nucleus RNA seq respectively, and the second biopsy is always um, fresh frozen um, in OCT um, material, basically. Um, and then section, section in a serial sectioning scheme um, where we then produce sections for H&E, SlideSeq, Codex, Murfish, and Exig, and we do this in two sets um, so that we have a better chance of getting at least one sample. Um, <clears throat> this is an overview of our data set um, that, that we obtained. Um, and what you can appreciate is, um, or I only, I'm only showing here the two most um, kind of drastic levels of um, clinical variability that we have in here, the metastasis sites and the receptor status, which is clinically very important. Mm. And 
basically this in this project there was no specific selection for um, for a certain subtype so for a certain site or for a certain receptor type but it rather displays the whole um, kind of the whole range of, of possible um, possible situations, which makes it a little bit hard to analyze because it's hard to ask specific questions because we always have these biological um, confounders, basically. Um, but it's very useful to get an idea of the overall situation or the overall disease. Um, we have uh, we have basically single cell and single nucleus data um, about for for half of the half of the samples, and then you can see that for the spatial methods it's a little bit more sparse. Um, but especially for Codex and SlideSeq, we basically have for pretty complete um, sets. Well, for Murfish and Exeq, um, there's a little bit more more holes. But we have a few samples where we basically um, have all the all the all the um, all the methods available. Um, so to start with a, sh a quick overview for the um, single cell and single nucleus data. And um, here annotated uh, the, the obligatory UMAPs annotated by, by cell type. And um, just glancing over it, it kind of looks similar. So we identify all the major cell types with both methods. But if you look in detail, um, you might notice that especially for the single nucleus data, there's a lot more um, kind of fine-grained um, cell types in, in the stromal compartment. And especially um, like prominent, um, you see that there's a lot more hepatocytes also profiled in the single nucleus data while um, compared to the, the single cell RNA-seq data. And this becomes even more um, obvious when we kind of summarize the cell types by compartments. So malignant, stromal, lymphoid, and myelid um, compartments. Um, in, in the in single nucleus data, we just we, we clearly have a lot more um, blue and orange, so malignant and stromal, so the cells that hold together, hold the tissues together, that stick together, and we think that this basically means the cells are rather lost in in the dissociation and process of single cell RNA seq, um, rather than um, basically failing to capture the immune cells. Which, when I started this project, was the the hypothesis that single nucleus RNA seq uh, RNA seq fails to capture. The, the immune cells because RNA is lower, more lowly expressed or so, but by now I think we're, we're quite convinced that it's the other way around, that we just capture more of, of the stromal part of the tissue. Um, one thing that is also kind of prominent here is that we have basically one cluster for the healthy cell types, but for the malignant cell types in green, we have a lot of different clusters. And um, you have to believe me, but basically each cluster corresponds to each pa uh, each cluster or one cluster corresponds to one patient. Um, so basically, we have we have really high patient um, specificity here in the malignant cell types, but not in the in the healthy cell types, which is something that is seen across um, all, also other cancers, but not as as not necessarily as prominent. So sometimes it, it seems to. Um, th there seems to be less heterogeneity there. So we were um, interested, and this is actually the only um, result that I'm going to show from the single cell data only, um, to, to assess more these, this interpatient variability um, of, of these metastases. And so we did something really simple, actually. We just made pseudobulk um, profiles um, for each of the malignant populations from each of the, from each of the metastases. Um, we normalized it with combat, so very easy. Um, also, to uh, non we didn't we batch corrected it for single cell versus single nucleus because that's really the primary um, like discriminating factor if you don't correct for it. But then um, we re really found this, um, yeah, very easy um, kind of correlation structure between between samples, um, where we cl clearly see that. Um, samples of the same patient, very strongly clustered together. And so this is um, basically the top annotation row. Um, and then we also found a very strongly correlated um, cluster, um, this, this little square box, um, also the second annotation row, um, which corresponds to the a basal um, intrinsic subtype. And this is interesting because the other subtypes, like there are four, four subtypes, HER2, um, lum, uh, luminal A and luminal B, and basal, and the other sub subtypes don't seem to have this, this strong, um, strong correlation structure um, between them. Mm, and this is particularly interesting if you consider that we're looking here at metastasis and not at primary tumor. So these cells, um, that the, the cells that produce 
um, this clustering, went through all this big process. They come from different uh, microenvironments. They come from different organs. Um, and, and still, they, they remain highly um, correlated in their expression profiles um, for the basal subtype, but not, not really these other subtype, subtypes. So there's still a lot to explore, and that's basically um, what we do with um, maybe yeah, what we do a little bit with the spatial, uh, the spatial data. So this is an overview um, of the 15 metastases basically that we used for for this for producing our spatial data. So as I said in the beginning, we have we um, do serial sections from the fresh frozen material. We have H and E that you're seeing here, and you can appreciate the the really drastic diversity. Um, we produce slide seek data, which is whole transcript home, 10 micrometer beads. Um, then MERFISH and XSEQ, which both target about 300 um, genes, and these are single molecule methods. And then also um, CODEX, which is a spatial proteomics method, where we target um, 50 proteins. And this is also kind of single cell um, resolution. So the different methods obviously have different representations, and this is just um, to kind of, uh, kind of compare the conceptual difference between, between all of these methods. So basically we have the single cell data, single nucleus data that we're all um, used to. We, we profile the RNAs within, um, within, the, within the cell. With protein it's a little bit different because protein can also sit outside of the cell, especially if we work in, in tissue, it can sit on the, on the surface. Um, and we, we get those two typical single cell RNA-seq um, UMAPs basically where cell type or clusters very strongly um, correlate with, with cell type. Now, if we do slide seek, um, what happens here is we also have the cells here with the dashed, um, dashed blue lines, and they also contain RNAs, but when we start measuring them, we basically put them on top of beads randomly, so we have no guarantee um, that an RNA from one, from one cell will also go to one bead, so we, we get this mixing of RNAs from different, um, different cells, even though the beads basically have the same size as a cell, so in theory, more or less um, one bead could correspond to one cell, but it, it doesn't. And accordingly, if we try to basically um, represent this in, in two dimensions, we get, um, we get a mix or a blob. Um, MERFIS is very interesting because there we measure single molecules actually here um, signified by these stars. And what we can do is we can basically segment those. We can segment um, the cells using image-based methods. Um, or we can, bin, we can bin our data and basically produce in silico slide seek light, light data. And um, in the bottom, we, um, I'm showing these two representations. So that with the segmented cells, the, the UMAP pretty much looks like the, um, the single cell RNA-seq UMAP. But with the bins, um, again, we get the blob, although in uh, MERFISH we get a little bit more, more structure, but this is probably due to the high sensitivity or higher sensitivity of MERFISH compared to SlideSeq. And then finally with um, CODEX, which is very different, um, we measure the intensity or the, the signal intensity um, of proteins, um, which can also sit on the cell surface and so on. Um, so we have, I think we have to deal with a little bit more background. We have the um, antibody-based um, background and so on. So also there we get more of a, of a blobby um, UMAP, but um, also in this case at least um, quite some structure. And so surely, as you all know, um, and there are a lot of people are working on it, and it's a challenge to annotate um, the, the spatial data when you don't have a clear and um, basically cell type specific structure in, in, the, in, in terms of, of clusters or so. So this makes everything hard. And um, to deal with that and a lot of other things, um, we developed yet another um, annotation transfer method, TACO, transfer of annotations to cells and, cell, uh, and their combinations. So um, it's not necessarily only for spatial data. It can also do all kinds of other things where we have combinations um, of cells. The paper is not online yet, but the repository is completely online, well documented, ready to, ready to use. 
And apart from transferring annotations, it can also do a lot of other things, but um, let me walk you through. Um, so the core, it, 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 it's basically all centered around core annotation methods, and it comes with its native um, annotation methods that we're a little bit proud of, um, from, um, based on unbalanced OT, and we're proud of it because it's really memory efficient and really fast, and a little bit of a contrast to the GPU-based um, methods. But basically, it can be easily exchanged with other, other methods. Um, there are some implemented already, RCTD, Tangram, a lot of others, but any, any other method can also basically be um, put into this, in, into this framework. And then um, all the other neat things that come with this framework um, can be used, for example, boosters, um, for example, um, the platform normalization, and by sectioning and multi-center. Um, it also comes with um, some nice visualization functions, for example, a scatter plot with compositional coloring, um, heat maps with row and column clustering, so a little bit trivial things, but just convenient. Um, and then what I'm also going to talk more about in the rest of the talk um, is the downstream analysis um, that are designed to work with comp uh, um, compositional compositional data. So I'm going to show an example of data-driven segmentation. So this is specifically interesting for something like um, from Murfish, where we have single molecule data. Look at a little bit at co-occurrence, um, observation splitting and regionization. Um, all an example of how we use it to, to analyze these met metastasis samples. So first of all, um, how does it, how, basically this is now the exact same um, data that I showed before as, as UMAP. So here, um, this is how the cell types look in space. And I, I find it particularly fascinating in the spin version of Murfish, where you see these, these vessel structures, where you really can see, I hope you can see it on the big screen, um, this vessel structure with smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells, basically one, um, one, lining, one lining each just to mention one, um, but clearly you can also see uh, differences between, uh, between these methods, and you can also see that you lose quite a lot of signal by um, basically image-based um, segmentation, which motivates what I'm going to talk about um, later. Um, interesting is also that it works quite well for Codex 2. It's not 100% stable yet, so for some samples, I think so, something like two or three out of all of these samples, it just doesn't work at all. It gives completely um, random random things, but for the others, it works really well, and, and for this, this sample um, in particular, you get, basically get very similar annotations um, spatially. Um, we also compared a little bit um, to other methods, um, not super systematically because we do, did that in the, in the paper, and in the TACO paper. Um, but here, for example, you can see, uh, especially the codex, um, codex annotation um, boost uh, that we get from the TACO OT um, compared to um, RCTD, which we, we also found um, to be a very stable um, and good annotation method. We also compare um, to Tangram that basically gives um, very similar um, patterns. Um, <clears throat> so here I'm showing the, an example for the um, single molecule annotation and segmentation. So it's, it's basically examples, um, 200 micrometers by 200 micrometers for two um, very different um, samples or metastasis. Um, on the very left, we're just showing genes. So one color is one gene or one RNA type. Um, in space and using, using TACO, basically, we annotated each single molecule to its most likely um, cell type of origin. And based on this, um, we can also then um, say actually segment the cell so that um, each RNA is kind of assigned to, to a specific cell. And you can, basically, in this middle cell type plot, you can really appreciate these, these different structures. So in the, in the upper sample, we have this clear separation of malignant um, cells in green, and then the, the vessel structures um, that are lined also with the blue um, macrophages, while in the, or monocytes, no macrophages in this case, while in the, in the lower sample, we basically have a, yeah, very, very good mixing of, of in basically vessel structures and, and also the, uh, and the malignant cells. And this, um, I want to look at the, the top sample a little bit more in terms of um, co-occurrence analysis. 
And so this is basically very similar um, to what is also implemented in, in Squid, SquidPy. If anything, it's a tiny, tiny little bit faster. <laughs> um, um, but um, what, what is really, no, what I really want to show here is that we capture this, um, this signal of um, cell type, uh, or the signal of um, basically exclusion between, uh, between malignant cells and all other cell types across the board, but it's much weaker in, in SlideSeq and XSeq, and um, XSeq is it, it's kind of obvious why. It's, it's just a very, very tiny, um, tiny region um, profile. But in SlideSeq, for example, even though SlideSeq is clearly um, has, has some prob problems or known problems um, in terms of, of capture, RNA capture rate or sensitivity because it is whole transcriptome, it measures the whole transcriptome. Um, it, even there, we, we captured the signal. Um, now to the observation splitting and regionization. Um, here, it's, this is again the same sample. And on the left, um, I'm showing the original, um, the original UMAP um, basically of, of, the, of, of the data for SlideSeq, MERFISH, and the BIN version of MERFISH. Again, in MERFISH, we have the single cell-like um, structure. Um, but for SlideSeq and the BIN version of MERFISH, we have the blobs. And what we can then do is with the, with the observation splitting is basically that we, that we um, disentangle the profiles, the expression profiles for, each, um, for each, each observation. So for each observation, we get one cell type specific profile. And then when we do our, our dimensionality reduction, we get these um, clearer cell type specific profiles. And here I'm uh, showing for RCTD and OT. And to be honest, here RCTD work better for this um, observation splitting. So to continue with the regionization, um, we use the RCTD. And what we can do after this observation splitting is that we can say, OK, now we're only interested in the malignant um, cell types. Like we, don't, we want to define regions only based on the malignant cell types, only based on signals from the malignant um, cell types. And what we do, did here is that we basically identified something like three, um, three regions. Um, that are very consistent across the two SlideSeq replicates. And with the, the BIN version of MERFISH, we can also, we can find some correspondence. Um, what we did then is um, basically did, did sim very simple differential expression analysis um, between, between the regions. And also on, on the expression level, um, these regions between SlideSeq and MERFISH fit quite well. And we could somewhat um, identify them as, as immune um, signaling, basically, in the direction of type 1 interferon, um, memory pro proliferation in the middle, and in the, in the end part, um, epithelial to mesenchymal um, transition. And yeah, and with this, I want to have one more analysis because maybe you noticed, but everything I showed so far was only within one, um, basically one metastasis. So we didn't really do anything yet across metastasis. And this is an example of within um, method but across a metastasis analysis. But what we do here is, again, I'm only showing the, for the segmented MERFISH now. So it's really easy to only have malignant cells. So I'm only plotting the malignant cells, um, but they are colored by um, basically the frequency of, or, or by the, the presence of NKT cells in their, um, in their spatial um, bin, which is 100 micrometers. Um, large. So if it's so basically blue means um, not so many um, NKT cells and uh, uh, a lot of NKT cells and orange means not so many NKT cells. And I ordered the, um, the metastasis um, whether um, overall they have uh, more NKT cells or um, less NKT cells. And what we can do then is again um, basically differential expression analysis between across all of these metastases between regions with high um, in NKT cells and low NKT cells. Remember, it's only the malignant cells that we're looking at. And there, basically, we find um, yeah, some sensible signals. I mean, for the ones where we have high NKT cells, we have a lot of um, MHC1-related um, um, expression. And then the really interesting finding um, is basically that in, in the ones where we have low, um, where we have low N uh, NKT cell contributions, um, we find SOX4 as a, as a very highly um, differentially or highly expressed gene. And it, it had recently be sh be sh been shown that SOX4 um, 
is kind of associated with um, immune evasion in triple negative breast cancer cells, but it seems also uh, in non -triple, not triple negative because these are not only triple negative. Yeah, and um, with this, I'm already at my summary slide. So for the single cell data, um, I showed a kind of large clinic, uh, clinically and technically um, diverse data set, data set of um, breast cancer metastasis. Um, the single cell versus a single nucleus, it's same, same, but different. So you, we, we basically get the same um, signals, or same sim kind of similar cell types, similar overall um, overall pictures, but they, these, these um, methods are clearly different um, in terms of the cell type composition and also the expression profiles. This has to be very clearly said, but um, it can be accounted uh, for them. And we use pseudobulk analysis to have really a clean um, assessment of interpatient heterogeneity and not be um, kind of confused by um, different cell type compositions. Um, yeah, and for the for the spatial data, um, we have this consecutive um, section, these consecutive sections that we profile with the four four different very different methods. Um, presented TACO, um, which is a very versatile framework for. Comp um, compositional data analysis. Um, TACO OT in spe uh, specifically um, is kind of is is helpful for providing common annotations for very diverse um, data types, so across um, spatial transcriptomics and proteomics. And then we also have these, which is kind of special for this project, I think, because usually you don't do so many different methods, that we have this, this, these multiple axes of analysis, so we can do across and within a metastasis and methods. So um, if you think about it, it's, it's, it looks like a heaven for validation, so we have the same thing me measured with a lot of different methods, and you can say, yeah, great, so you can finally validate um, our, our findings in, in, in the different methods, but um, it's a, it, so it's, it's in principle great, but it's also a challenge because these methods are just so different. And for example, would you reject something that you find in Murfish just because you don't find it in Slidesig? You can find a million reasons why you wouldn't find something in Slidesig or vice versa. Um, this just um, a little bit for, for the challenge. Um, and now really important, of course, um, the acknowledgement slide. So a lot of people um, were involved. Um, so this is all as part of the Human Tumor Atlas pilot project. Um, which is also part of the Human Tumor Atlas network. Um, and then, um, of course, the, all the, spa the, the people who generated these incredible spatial data, um, the clinical people from um, the Anna Faber Cancer Institute and CCPM, um, of course, the people from the Broad and um, Klaman Cell Observatory, um, people from um, pathology who did an incredible job in annotating and um, selecting samples or basically um, profiling samples for, for goodness, um, and then people who, um, who were involved um, with the spatial analysis. And of course, I want to thank um, all the patients and their families, without whom this would not have been possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing this. A lot of uh, real blast of insights and uh, lots of questions discussed. I just want to pick up one um, point. You emphasized the binning repeatedly uh, compared to segmenting cells and doing the analysis. And I was just wondering, is this because the cell segmentation is a hard problem? Or would you get the same benefits if you first segment and then just average the segmented single cell expression profiles within the same bins, i.e. it's just a matter of having low counts per cell, mm. but if you have more, you know, within a bin, you have higher counts and your log counts work and your UMAP works better. Do you have any insights? No, I think, it, uh, I mean, yes. So I think in this case, it's really the problem of segmenting, so that this is a hard problem. We, we discussed this with the people who did the binning and they wanted to be very clean, so they just excluded, uh, sorry, not the binning, the segmenting. They excluded a lot of segmented cells because they were not sure that they were perfectly correctly segmented, especially if you have like mix of big cell types and small cell types. And but big. would you still get a benefit of binning or pseudo bulking within those regions no, if you had cells? It's really just a matter yeah. that you're, you're basically you're yeah, basically the, the data matrix that we start with has all the data. It's it's exactly the same data. And just if for a molecule we have a segment uh, segmented cell assigned, it has the segmented cell assigned, and otherwise it doesn't have it assigned. It. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, 
Um, yeah, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, I think my question would be more biological. Um, so there is also a epigenetic aspect to metastasis and plasticity. Um, is it just enough to look at single cell in the spatial, or do we also need to that that um, epigenetic information as well to make a broader conclusion about um, what's actually involved? I agree that it's super interesting, but what we would need, like I mean, here we only have transcriptomics or proteomics data. The proteomics data, I can already say, um, it won't work because we didn't profile any epigenetic. Um, proteins basically that could um, change the epigenetic landscape, but with the with the expression um, data, I think it might be interesting to actually see if we if we find regulation of, of epigenetic um, ep epigenetically involved um, genes. But we don't for this data set we don't have any kind of primary epigenetic data like DNA methylation or, or chromatin accessibility or something like that. But I agree that would be really interesting. One more question. Is this data public or? Not yet. Not yet. Thank you. But the tool, TACO, is public. Yeah. Thank you. We would have time for one quick final question, if there is. Um, so following up on Oli's question, uh, could you just quickly elaborate how you did the segmentation of the MERFISH data? In 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, very simply, we do the single molecule annotation, and then we basically just see which molecules go together, like fit together best so that it's the same cell type, very placatively. So, but it is the, the important thing, it is based on the single molecule annotation. That's the first step. Thank you. Okay, now we have two short talks. Uh, the first one is by Julio Cesc Rodriguez, who is a professor at the University of Heidelberg and a group leader at the EMBL Heidelberg partner unit of some sort. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thanks, Christoph, for the kind introduction, and thanks to Fabia and Maria and Oli for putting together this great meeting and the chance to share some of our work with you. So what I want to talk about is how we can use biological prior knowledge to help machine learning or statistics in the analysis of a single cell or spatial omics data. And uh, there is a simple way how we can do this. We can simply use it, as I will show you, to extract some signatures that then we can input into our favorite algorithm. This has two benefits. One is that we reduce our large omics data into a smaller number of features, so we increase the statistical power but also that these tend to be more interpretable mechanistically, so we can better understand what's happening. There are many other ways to use prior knowledge, and actually we have seen, for example, Christoph mentioning his knowledge prime neural networks, or Mo in Fabian's lab developed XPMAP, and I think uh, tomorrow Stein will talk about Scenic or Scenic Plus, where, so you know, there are many other ways to use prior knowledge. And uh, what uh, yeah, we'll show you is, is our tools and resources in this context that we hope are helpful for you, and we're also really happy if this can contribute to more uh, uh, common developments such as the SCVERS that was uh, introduced before. Okay, so the first thing that we need to use prior knowledge is to have access to it. And for this, over the years, we've developed a tool called OmniPath. So OmniPath is just a one-stop shop that allows you to pull knowledge from over 100 different resources and, and counting. And we started with things such as biological networks, but over the years, mostly driven by our own needs, we included other things such as uh, complexes and notations, or recently for single cell things such as cell cell interactions. So this is available in R or also in Python. In fact, can be used already from uh, SkyPy, SquidPy environment. And we are now in the process of uh, rebuild it as a graphical uh, um, database. And by doing so, we are developing uh, a more common language that allow us to also bridge the other type of, of knowledges uh, beyond molecular, such as chemoinformatics or clinical data. So if you want to know more about this, uh, I'm happy to tell you more later. So once we have this knowledge, uh, as I said before, one way we can use it is to extract features. And we have found it's particularly powerful to think of uh, anomics data as somewhere where you can look for the footprint of a process of interest. So you can use the knowledge to know which molecules are going to change when something that you are interested in is more or less active. 
And this can be, if you think of transcriptomics, the activity of a pathway. So you can look for changes in the genes that you know are controlled by a pathway, and by how they go up or down, see how active is this pathway. And we have seen that this is much more effective than look, for example, at the expression of the components of the pathway, because these components are proteins, and the target genes tell us more about their activity. So we have developed a resource score progeny for this, and we are now developing an extension of this. Similarly, we can look at changes of, of the target genes of a transcription factor to see if it's more or less active. And again, for this, we develop uh, an integration of different resources that we are uh, also expanding at the moment. So when you have this type of uh, target genes, these, these gene sets, you need some enrichment or statistical method to better assess or to assess the activity of a process of interest. And to help on this, Pao Badia, who is in the audience and has the poster right there, develop, uh, together with other members of the lab, a tool decoupler that allows you to run any of a large number of enrichment methods from the simple over-representation analysis to, let's say, AU cell, which is underneath Senec. So this allows us to run many methods, to combine them, uh, and also Pao and the team put a lot of effort on making this really uh, efficient. So in particular, the Python version, it's very scalable, so you can really run it on large data sets. So I just mentioned the Scenic, and I guess Stein will tell us tomorrow, tomorrow more about Scenic Plus, which is this uh, cool tool to infer gene regulatory networks from single cell RNA and attack. And if you are in this field, you will have noticed that there is uh, a large number of tools in this space. Uh, so they all combine attack and RNA to, to build gene regulatory networks. And then Pao has, again, in his poster, um, a, a tool, a resource called Greta, which is a, a gene regulatory network analysis where he, together with uh, Lorna and Rem in the lab, but also collaborating with Stein Labs or uh, Ivan Seitz Lab, as well as Judith Sauk and, and Carl Herman, were trying to develop a framework to better understand the strengths and weaknesses of these methods and to analyze the downstream results. And, and this is really something we would like to do as a community. So if any of you is interested in this topic, please go to talk to Pau or to myself. So as I said, in this Omnipath, we have a lot of different types of knowledge, so you can really use it as a place from which you can run many different types of analysis. I mentioned estimate pathways, estimate activities. You can also run other tools like, like NicheNet. And something that we look in a bit of more detail recently is all of these cell-cell communication methods that we also heard about them today. And, and as, as you know, if, if you work on, on these methods, there is many methods and also they use different uh, resources. So to understand a bit better their pros and cons, uh, Daniel Dimitrov, a student in the lab, developed this, this framework called Liana, which allows you to combine and compare the different methods and different databases of cell-cell communication. And it's very hard to really benchmark well cell-cell communication, to really have true bona fide cases where cells are truly talking and you have single cell RNA. But through a number of uh, indirect uh, benchmarks and analysis, we, we came to the conclusion that even though uh, you get different results across these methods, so it's maybe not that you can truly trust the results of any particular method. Most of them capture signal, and, and because of the differences, we suggest uh, to use them in combination and then trust kind of the consensus information that different methods can give you. So this is cell-cell communication, and we're also very interested in, in the other part, in the intracellular network, so how you, from RNA or other omics data, you try to delineate uh, key pathways in the cell. And we recently uh, reviewed some of these, these methods. So if you are more on the algorithmic side, uh, there are many ways to try to build this network. So either the neural networks from the KPNN from Christoph lab to simple shortest paths or diffusion methods. And in our case, we have used a lot integer linear programming as a very efficient way to build large networks. Uh, also, if you don't have necessarily a lot of data, but also we are currently in the process of expanding this methods, and, and again, it's something we are really happy to do in, in combination with other groups to develop a framework to apply different network uh, methods. So I, I just give you a quick overview on, the, on, on some of the tools that we have developed mostly for RNA, and in particular for single cell RNA. So now I would like to talk a bit more about space, and after all, this is the spatial uh, session. And uh, I will simply, uh, uh, illustrate with some vignettes of, of a study for which uh, Ricardo has a poster, one of the digital ones, so you have to chase it across the screens, but better chase uh, uh, Ricardo to, to tell you more about this. 
So this is a, a recent project uh, in collaboration with the groups of uh, Rafael Kramer and Ivan Costa in Aachen and Henry Milk in Weyhausen, where we used um, multi-omic technologies, so single nuc RNA attack and visium, spatial transcriptomics to study a myocardial infarction. So Ricardo, together with Christoph Kupe and Sijen Lee, in both in Aachen, uh, did this, this work, and again, Rico can tell you more later. So I will only give you a couple of, of vignettes. So as also Omer mentioned, we used the tool that he and all his lab developed cell to location to combine single cell RNA and spatial transcriptomics to, to better um, look at the compositions in the different samples. We use the tools I showed you before, these footprint methods to estimate activity of pathways, the activity of transcription factors in different places. So what you see here is one example of, of a patient who has a chronic myocardial um, or heart failure. And you can see on the, on the top right uh, two different major type of fibroblasts. And then how using these pathway transcription factor methods, you can see which key processes are involved, something relatively unsurprising that TGF beta is involved in fibrosis, but just as an illustration of how you can use these methods also in the context of um, spatial data. Uh, but what is more interesting if you have a spatially resolved data is that you can try to use it to better understand uh, the interactions uh, between different places in, in, in the tissue. Again, again, here there is uh, a lot of uh, great methods that you can use. In our case, uh, Joe Antonevsky developed uh, a framework called MISTI, which allows you to, to dissect interactions between different spots using um, a multi-view uh, machine learning framework. Um, we have applied to other data sets, like, um, uh, in fact, the, the data we saw in the, in the previous talk from Johanna, but also in this case, in, in this uh, spatial transcriptomic data in, in the heart. And by doing so, we could, for example, identify how the presence of um, a, a particular type of macrophages, these SPP1 positive macrophages, uh, tend to define the presence in their environment of myofibroblasts. So this is analysis done with this MISTI tool on, based on the estimated cell proportions of uh, the spatial transcriptomic data, but then uh, Christoph Kupe in Aachen followed this up with, with a group of, of uh, Dennis Shapiro in Heidelberg, uh, also to look at the co-localization of these cells. So I've been uh, very fast uh, because this is a short talk, but I hope I could give you a flavor of the type of things we do. And again, I really encourage you to go to uh, Pau and Ricardo to the sports test and to talk to myself. They did most of the work I saw you together with Dennis, who led Omnipath, and Jovan, who developed this MISTI framework for spatial transcriptomics. We are, like most people, always looking for uh, students and, and postdocs. And, and just to, to summarize this point, that we really think there is a lot of value in using biological knowledge to support some of the great uh, tools that uh, we are seeing here. And we are really happy if this is helpful for you, and we're really always uh, open to collaborate and work together in any of these aspects. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, any questions over there? Thanks, Julio. Uh, I was wondering about combining prior knowledge from many different sources. Doesn't it make everything connected with everything? And then is there a good way of combining uh, things together? Yeah, Lale, you're, you're right. So in, indeed, if you keep um, putting things at the end, everything is connected. And the way we try to deal with this is that so in, in Omnipath, you can select by different ways what you include. So you can pick some resources or not the others because some resources have high coverage but have lower quality. There is almost always this, this trade-off um, or they are maybe more focused, let's say, in the immune system or in cancer. So you can pick uh, what you want. You can also try to look for things that are only present in different resources, ideally resources that use different type of data to be built. So you have some sort of orthogonal combination. And we found that uh, many times, it really depends uh, what you should use. We tend to start with sparse knowledge, and because normally pick the high quality but sparse knowledge, and then if it's not enough, add in more. But this is always uh, yeah, something that has to be done in a case-specific manner. There was one question in the back, please.
Yes, uh, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, I would say I already tried the Liana tool and I'm very excited about that. However, uh, following the previous uh, question and answers that you gave, I'm wondering, so far Liana, the, uh, this aggregated tool does uh, something like a mean rank and as you indicated right now, it's needed to kind of weight the sources that you have and some kind of combine them in a wise way, but not averaging and provide with the average score. So. The technical question is, are you going to adjust the Liana in terms that it will be weighted in a particular way or the user should do it by himself? So yeah, this is something we are working on and along combining with other type of uh, evidence. I think where there is a lot of value is, and there are other tools doing this, if you connect this to downstream changes, like support by changes in the targeting, so transcription factors or what was discussed, I think was, yeah, uh, Fabian asking about the space to Omer's talk. Uh, yeah, so I think there is, um, besides the, the, the right weighting, I think there is a lot of value in adding other type of uh, orthogonal knowledge as well. Okay. Next question, also in the back, please. Since you have a lot of experience in comparing different methods, I was wondering if adding prior knowledge not uh, if you know if adding prior knowledge not only enables better interpretability, but could also potentially improve performance, as was recently suggested in XPMAP and in some other methods that use some kind of biological constraints, what would be your opinion on that? I, I'm probably biased, but I, I agree. Uh, I mean, the knowledge, of course, on one hand, uh, it can add misleading information, and at the same time, also, it doesn't cover everything. So. It will depend also on the quality of the knowledge and, and how you use it. Uh, but in principle, I do agree that knowledge, because yeah, it improves the, at the end the statistical power. Uh, it, it should help you in, in prediction in particular, yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, okay, fight. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry. Maybe you have the same question. Um, I just wondering what's the latest, and it goes really what many people highlight here in uh, in terms of assessing whether the prior knowledge is right and correct, right? I mean, you know, if it's if it's co incorrect, is garbage in, garbage out? Mm. And are, are there any diagnostic tools? Is the grand elephant in the room? Is there hope or? I, I think in general it's a big elephant in the room, and uh, I, I guess one could go over this for a long time because it probably depends on what type of knowledge. So I, I mentioned anything from. Uh, cell cell ligand receptor binding to transcription factor target binding, and I think everything is different. Uh, and, and maybe, yeah, people like Stein can comment on this for the transcription factor target. I think we are better shaped to, to look at ground truth, or maybe not, but I really think things like cell cell communication are hard, to, not very hard to, to, to have good ground truths. Okay, thank you. The next talk will be given by Mark, uh, Markus Mittenzweig, who is currently a postdoc at the Weizmann Institute with Amos Tanmai. And if I understand correctly, you're a fully trained mathematician. Uh, yes, yes, more or less, yeah. Uh, okay, good luck. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, thanks again to the organizers for the possibility to talk here today at this very um, nice and uh, cozy meeting so far. And so on the last minutes of uh, today's uh, session, I want to talk you, take you on a short uh, trip towards um, gastrulation, more specifically gastrulation in the mouse. And uh, what is gastrulation? So it, in the mouse, it starts around uh, day 6.5 uh, with, a, with a small embryo and a, small, uh, and a single layer of pluripotent cells, and then roughly 24 to 36 hours later, uh, you see uh, the emergence of the basic body axis and the uh, specification of the uh, basic embryonic lineages. So you have a big explosion of uh, transcription and cellular diversity uh, during that uh, time window of development. And uh, so our representation of the, so, so again, yeah, let me highlight uh, that, uh, as you said, I'm a postdoc uh, in the group of Amistad Nye, and everything that I will show you uh, now has been in collaboration with the group of uh, Jonathan Stelzer, in particular with uh, Yoav, uh, Saifeng, Roni, and uh, Hernan. And so our representation of the process uh, now in the next minutes is this um, 
nice uh, transcriptome map that you see here, and uh, and uh, like maybe special thing uh, that we have here is that actually this uh, map doesn't represent the single embryo, but rather a superposition of 153 embryos uh, sampled continuously between 6.5 and E8, and because we used uh, uh, like a plate-based uh, sequencing, uh, we not only have like the, of course the transcription uh, profiles for each cell, but we also know the embryo each cell uh, came from. And uh, what you see at the bottom is the uh, transcription. Uh, this is like the composition setup composition of each embryo, and uh, uh, the embryos are ordered according to their uh, transcription time. And I think. So I want to highlight uh, two things when you look at it. So first of all, the process is uh, on this level very reproducible, very robust, right? So you, even though you see some variance from embryo to embryo, you see we basically have a continuous uh, uh, sampling uh, of the, uh, or you have like a, you, see you have like a continuous transition uh, in the cell type composition of the embryo. And, and because we have this continuous sampling of the time axis, this made us, uh, naturally think about um, about um, kind of connecting the different time points. So think about now we bin embryos uh, into some time groups and then um, which you see here and then now the question rises, can we actually connect the different time points? And this made us natural, naturally think about uh, um, like um, approaches like OT, like conservation, uh, like optimal transport where you uh, basically, you have this uh, assumption of uh, of a conservation of mass, which uh, in our setting is uh, pretty much fulfilled. So, because we've sampled the whole embryo, we essentially know that for when you compare different time points, we know that every cell, the first time point, uh, won't disappear, but must give rise to cell the second time point, and uh, vice versa. Every cell, the second time point, must come from cell uh, at the first time point, and this gives you. Uh, a pretty uh, powerful constraint for inferring now the, the, the transitions between the different uh, time points. So what we want to do is we, we sample uh, at different time points, of course, these embryos, but of course uh, what's happening in reality is that those cells travel uh, continuously along our transcription map, and we want to infer these trajectories. Okay, and uh, unless you maybe by already looking at it, what you might appreciate that this conservation of mass uh, constraints gives you a, a pretty uh, uh, powerful uh, constraint for inferring the transitions. For example, you might say when you compare the first two time points that uh, that this brown mass of epiblast, because you have less epiblast in the second time point, this means that some of the epiblast uh, must turn into a different cell type. But then again, uh, this also means uh, that some of the of the purple nascent mesoderm cannot only cannot go into an nascent mesoderm, but must again differentiate into a, some more differentiated mesoderm. So, and then you can kind of iteratively uh, um, construct these transitions. And, and as I said, we use kind of a, um, a variation of the, of the OT idea. So we have two ingredients here. We have a, a first uh, a distance measure for our for our meta cells, so meta cells are just small groups of cells, like 100 cells per meta cell, roughly, and we have a, like a distance measure, which is uh, basically a logistic distance be between the uh, expression profiles of the feature genes. And the second ingredient is that we also have to model uh, proliferation rates, right? Because of course, changes in cell type composition can also arise not only from differentiation but also from uh, changes in their proliferation rate. And then you can uh, combine these two approaches, and if I have time at the end, maybe I can go into the details, but for now let me just uh, show you what, uh, what comes out. So what we, what we obtain uh, as, as a result of the inference, uh, you see on the y-axis again the time, like the different time groups, and then on the x-axis you have the meta cells, and you see we infer these transitions for each time point uh, or for each uh, uh, two subsequent time points, we, we infer these transitions between uh, meta cells. And on the right, you see uh, uh, the summary on the, the, on the level of uh, cell types. So now, now we have this. This is basically the basis for everything that will follow. So you can think about, for example, now combining it with um, 
with uh, MITRE-ROM data that is now available, like trying to infer epigenetic flows or trying to predict uh, uh, gene expression uh, using um, uh, attack uh, accessibility. Uh, you can, of course, uh, Single out, single out a specific trajectory, for example, the, the blood lens here, you can trace it back in time and then plot uh, like pseudo time uh, kinetics of genes along this trajectory. And, uh, but the thing that I want to talk about now in more detail is, um, is where we, how, we use, how we use this uh, flow model as a basis for understanding the uh, function of an epigenetic regulator that is active. Uh, during gastrulation. Okay, so now in the second talk, uh, in the second part, I want to talk about the three uh, TET enzymes, which are uh, which can actively demethylate DNA. And uh, as uh, many of you might might uh, know, the DNA methylation actually changes drastically during this early phase of development. So we start with uh, certain methylation levels early on uh, in the oocyte and sperm, then it goes down to very low levels of methylation in the inner cell mass, only to rise afterwards again uh, to high levels in the epiblast, which is the starting point uh, of, uh, of gastrulation. So when you now knock out these three TET enzymes, you're essentially asking what happens if I, uh, if I remove the active demethylating enzymes at this very uh, at the beginning of estimulation, which has these very high levels of uh, methylation. And so it's the first point, and it has been known now already for some time that if you knock out these three enzymes, it, it's actually associated with a very severe developmental phenotype, namely those uh, knockout embryos die shortly after gastrulation, and during gastrulation they are characterized by, a, uh, by, a, by being, first of all, smaller than uh, the usual embryos, so if you take out the TET triple knockout embryo at uh, 7.5, it looks more like a 6.5 embryo, and then later on, uh, they also develop into a very abnormal shape, which you see here at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so we, um, we wanted to revisit this uh, phenotype using the following experimental approach. So what we are doing is essentially uh, injecting uh, Embryon, like knockout cells into the blastocyst, uh, then implanting them again into the um, into the mouse uterus, and then uh, subsequently we sequence them uh, using two approaches. First, uh, like in the chimera setting, where, uh, where as a result you get uh, knockout cells that are surrounded by white post cells, and then the second assay is a tetrabyte complementation assay, where you as a result get like. Uh, that all the embryonic cells are composed of uh, knockout cells, so all the, basically you get like a whole embryo knockout. Uh, and then again, we do these single cell, single embryo uh, sequencing afterwards. Okay, so let's jump into the, first into the whole embryo knockout. So what we, uh, indeed what we recover is uh, that uh, that also here in our case, they have this very abnormal shape and they are smaller than usually E7.5 embryos. Uh, and when, when you look at, uh, uh, at, this, at, at this thing as a RNA map of those embryos, this coincides with the fact that they, that they only populate a subpart of the manifold, as you can see on the right. So essentially, what we what we think they are doing is uh, when you now take again these f this uh, this uh, flow model that we have of the of the development of uh, during gastrulation, what these tetrapod knockout embryos do, they, uh, they 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 only follow a certain restricted path of development. So, for example, the epiblast only gives rise to the primitive streak, not to the ectoderm, and the nascent mesoderm only gives rise to subtypes of uh, mesoderm, namely extraembryonic mesoderm, and not the embryonic ones. Okay. And, but now here comes the big surprise. Now, if you repeat the same in the camera setting, suddenly the uh, knockout cells look pretty normal. As you can see there in the middle, so they populate the whole uh, transcriptional map. And also time-wise, uh, the knockout cells are not similar and are not different from the white eye post cells, so they look completely fine. Okay, now given this discrepancy, we want to, of course, to, 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 to understand better how, how this comes, right? Uh, that the chimera is so different from the, from the whole embryo knockout. And of course, we have the transcription uh, profiles. And, uh, and surprisingly, when you look 
Um, at the, for example, at the EpiBlast and the camera and the whole ambient setting, you don't see big differences overall, right? So what you see here on the right is four columns are from the knockout uh, embryos from the camera and tetraploid assay, and and you, uh, you see like uh, most of the genes are not more than twofold differentially expressed, but there are a few, uh, let's say, stars at the bottom which have show higher levels, and among them, I want to highlight. Uh, that uh, particularly in the nascent mesoderm, uh, you see the strong downregulation of lefty 2 and also, for example, of the uh, 1 and, uh, and FJ15. So you see uh, quite a bit stronger downregulation in, in the nascent mesoderm of certain signaling molecules. And so our interpretation is uh, that overall, like uh, this drastic change in methylation translates into only mild changes uh, uh, in the transcription profiles, but uh, but there are some exceptions uh, where maybe you have like a fourfold and eightfold difference. And if, this, if those exceptions are signaling molecules which are secreted and which are known to be very powerful, um, uh, let's say, determinants of uh, cell, uh, cell fates, then this can, in a whole embryo setting, completely alter the, let's say, uh, differentiation landscape of the embryo. But in a camera setting, this is uh, tolerated because you have the host uh, environment. Okay. So uh, that's not so much time left, so let me just mention that uh, we are, this, the, like what I showed you before, highlighted the importance of intercellular signaling. So we have also, we are also working in this direction. So we have, uh, um, uh, Roni developed a method to knock out the, uh, let's say, a factor specifically in the extra embryonic ectoderm tissue. So we have now possibility to knock out not only cell, uh, let's say, for example, uh, BMP4 or EF5, which is shown here in the embryonic lineage, but also in experimental lineage, and we can now uh, use those uh, knockouts in different lineages and study the effect uh, on the different lineages. Uh, so with this, let me already come to my summary. So uh, let me mention that we also have data on TET double knockouts. We have, I didn't show you, data on the DNA methylation, which basically shows you a very, very strong effect on the DNA methylation level in the TET ribbon knockouts. And, uh, and uh, I, what, was, what we realized in this, uh, in this uh, um, journey of characterizing the uh, TET ribbon knockout is that there's a strong difference, of course, between the eventual uh, tissue phenotype and the first primary uh, intracellular effect, right? And, and using the, this very detailed, um, um, uh, let's say, um, sampling of the time axis, um, we, we, uh, we were able to kind of uh, dissect these uh, secondary from the uh, primary effect. Um, yeah, and with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for one short question over there, please. Just shout. Yeah, um, so that's of course a very interesting uh, question. Um, uh, so we tried to, at some point for the, let's say, trying to predict the transcription uh, with uh, using the transcription at the, let's say, previous time point. Uh, this was very, um, uh, not really, uh, didn't get very far because essentially, for example, in the mesoderm you have uh, co-expression of many, many different transcription factors, and it's most likely that you have like combinatorial effect of many and was like we didn't. But of course, now using, now using Mitium data, maybe you have a much better chance because, for example, maybe on the level of attack, uh, uh, this effect, uh, you can better dissect the effect of different factors because, yeah, let's say, certain peaks are only affected by uh, this TF and not by, by another one. But on the transcription level, of course, this is all convoluted, right? Yeah. Thank you.
now we have to move on to the next part. Um, thank you.